Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my name is Mahmoud Malik. I'm the regional coordinator of elders organization within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Ahmadiyya Muslim Association is the three wings. One is from five years old to 15, which is called the Tafal, and 15 to 40 is Khuddam, and 40 over is Ansar. On behalf of my community, allow me to say Assalamu Alaikum and welcome to the Peace Conference. This is one of the several peace conferences con organized by the Ahmadi community across the country. The purpose of the con conference is to promote, as the title stage, peace. Peace among different faiths, communities, and people. In the world today, we see divisions everywhere, such as race, ethnicity, religion, and class. There is also a lot of turmoil in the world, wars, conflicts, and tensions. The truth is, we are all humans. And regardless of color or faith, we all share the same problem in life, the same challenges, desires, and expectation as anywhere, anyone else. Rather than focus on differences, the purpose of this peace conference to all of us to come together, learn and respect each other, the other's faith, and concentrate on what we all share in common, our humanity. With these few words, now I would like to introduce to you guests on, we are grateful for their presence here tonight on the top table. They are on my far right is the president of Ahmadiyya Muslim Association Scotland, Mr. Abid. Next to him is Mr. Stuart Rorison, Chief Inspector, Johnson Police Office. Next to him is Honor Linda Fabiani, member of the Scottish Parliament. Next to that is Dr. Ijazur Rahman, Vice President, Ansarullah UK, an auxiliary organization of Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Next to that one is Molana Atal Momin, Professor, Ahmadiyya Missionary Training College, UK. Then is Molana Daud Ahmed Qureshi, missionary in charge for Scotland. And next to it, Tadius Umar. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal zina manuttakullaha haqqa tukati. Ittakullaha haqqa tukatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Wahtasimu bi khablillahi jamiyam wa la tafarraku wa zkuru. وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قَلُوبِكُمْ بَيْنَا قَلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِحْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا 
the merciful these holy recited which have been recited uh, before you are from chapter 3 surah ali imran verses 103 to 106 the english translation is o ye who believe fear allah and he should be feared and let not death overtake you except when you are in a state of submission and hold fast all together by the rope of allah and be not divided and remember the favor of allah which he bestowed upon you when you were enemies and he united your hearts in love so that by his grace you became as brothers and you were on the brink of a pit of fire and he saved you from it thus does allah explain to you his commandments that you may be guided and let there be among you a body of men who should invite to goodness and enjoin equity and forbid evil and it is they who shall prosper and be not like those who became divided and who dis- uh, who became divided and who disagreed among themselves after clear proofs had come to them and it is they for whom there shall be a great punishment ashhadu alla ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمدیہ مسلم کمیونٹی از ا فاسٹ گروئنگ انٹرنیشنل ریوائول موومنٹ ود ان اسلام فاؤنڈڈ ان 1889 اٹ سپینز اوور 195 کنٹریز ود ممبر شپ ایکسیڈنگ ٹینز اف ملینز The present head of the Ahmadiyya community is residing in the UK. <coughs> Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the only Islamic organization to believe that the long-awaited Masih or Mahdi has come in the person of His Holiness Mirza Ghulam Ahmad uh, of Qadiyan, who was born in India, uh, a remote village called Qadiyan in subcontinent of India. <coughs> He was born in 1835. In 1889, under the divine guidance of Allah the Almighty, he claimed to be the <coughs> metaphorical second coming of Jesus Christ. May peace and blessing of Allah be on him and the divine guide, whose advent was foretold by the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, may peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. Ahmadiyya Muslim community believes that God sent Ahmad alayhi salam like Jesus Christ to end religious wars condemn uh, condemn bloodshed and also reinstate 
the morality, justice, and peace in the world. Ahmad's advent has brought about revolutionary, a revolutionary era of Islamic revival. He also recognized noble teachings and the founders of, uh, and the founders of different religions and saints, including Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, Confucius, and Baba Guru Nanak. He also explains that uh, how the different teachings converge into the true religion of Islam. Ahmadiyya Muslim community categorically reject terrorism of any form. Over, this, over a century ago, Ahmad declared that an aggressive jihad of sword, uh, which is now very known in the world these days, has no place in Islam. In its place, he taught to his followers to wage a bloodless war, like the jihad of pen, means to write in defense of your religion and the values of your religion. At this end, Ahmad also wrote books, thousands of le uh, letters, and delivered hundreds of lectures, and also engaged in scores of uh, debates with different people from different religion backgrounds. Ahmadiyya, community, Ahmadiyya Muslim community is foremost Islamic organization with one central spiritual leader. Over a century ago, Ahmad reminded his followers of God's promise that he will safeguard the message of Islam through Khilafat, a spiritual institution of successorship to the prophethood. It believes that only spiritual successorship can uphold the true values of Islam and unite the humanity. Five spiritual heads means uh, Khulafa or successors have succeeded him since his demise in 1908. His fifth and current spiritual head, Mirza Masroor Ahmad, is residing in the United Kingdom, as mentioned earlier. Under the leadership of its spiritual successors, Ahmadiyya Muslim community is growing, as I have mentioned, in the world, and over 15,000 mosques or places of worship have been built, and the holy book, which is Holy Quran, has been translated into, this, into 70 languages, different languages of the world. Also, to promote the message of uh, Islam, there is a 24-hour channel, uh, M channel, which is called MTA, Sky 787. As uh, we, have, we know that through in, through, uh, throughout the world, that uh, when the Jesus Christ came and the, the followers of Jesus Christ, they have been doing a lot of work to the service of humanity. To his, it was obvious that uh, the second Jesus, uh, whom we believe that uh, he is the metaphorical coming of Jesus Christ, his followers should do the same thing. Now I would like to mention few achievements uh, of the community towards uh, service to the humanity. In 1971, under the leadership of its third successor, late Mirza Nasser Ahmad, the community started building schools and hospitals in extremely remote areas of West Af in Africa, mostly in West and East Africa. The number has now grown over 500 schools and 30 hospitals. As community is growing, uh, its four successor, late Mirza Tahir Ahmad, introduced a new way to serve the mankind by inaugurating Humanity First, an independent charity organization who has been at the forefront of worldwide disaster relief throughout the world. Humanity First is now registered in 33 countries across six continents and has been working, uh, working on human development projects and responding to disasters since 1995. Following are the few achievements, a few uh, of them, uh, you know, where this Humanity First is working, or the projects, Pakistan earthquake, Asian tsunami, 
Katharina and Rita Hurricane Relief, Guyana Flood Relief, Relief of Victims of Turkey Earthquake, Relief of Victims of Earthquake in Gujarat, India, Help for People in Sierra Leone During the Civil War, Relief During the Bosnian, Bosnian Conflict, Help for Kosovo Refugees. The Humanity First is also running some regular projects, mostly in Africa. These are few of them are this, that uh, fighting against illiteracy in Africa, our kids, our future program, feed a family, gift of sight, uh, aid consignment for West Africa, often care, free medical camps, water for life, computer courses to train youth in that area, and uh, computer centers, sewing and knitting training centers in different parts of the Africa, mostly for the girls and ladies. In, U in United Kingdom, the community is also organizing charity walks, and every year, on different levels, we raise funds, and dozens of UK-based charities are now among the beneficiaries who regularly benefit from these funds. Every year, the collection is also increasing by thousands of pounds. In Scotland, the community is in contact with some charities who are also the beneficiaries of these funds. Among them are Steth, Kelvin, Talking Newspaper, Macmillan, Save the Children, Seagull Trust. For the information of our guests, I would like to mention here that uh, on the 29th of October, this, uh, our youth is coming to uh, Johnston here for bag, bagpacking at a Morrison Superstore in Johnston from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. to support the charity Save the Children. Recently, the community also organized 6K walk for York Hill Children Hospital and raised 6,000 pounds. Then this money was also handed over to the hospital. The unique thing about all these achievements, particularly the charity works are that uh, there is no a single penny administrative charges involved in it. All funds collected are given to different charities. So I hope that uh, uh, by this you have known that not only that uh, on the religious ground, the community is working to promote the, relig the message of uh, Islam and the message of peace, but also we are doing a lot of humanitarian work throughout the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, can I begin by expressing my thanks to all of those responsible for organizing this evening's conference, for their kind invitation to be here, and for the opportunity to address you on the role of the, the, the police and the establishment of peace in society. The Police Scotland Act 1967, and I promise that is the only piece of legislation that I'll bore you with this evening. But that act lays down in law the functions and responsibilities of the police service in Scotland. And those responsibilities are many, but the main ones that would, I would relate to this evening's event would be the responsibility to prevent crime, the responsibility to protect life and property, and the responsibility to preserve order, to preserve peace. I don't think I need to tell anybody here, and over 27 years, police service tells me that there is a small minority of people, and I emphasize a small minority, who make that peace, vision, the vision for peace, very difficult for us. Whether that be on an international level, and some of the terrorist attacks that we've seen throughout the world against a number of targets over recent years, or whether that be on a more local level in terms of some of the antisocial behavior, the disorder, even the violence that we often see in some of our own towns and communities. Strathclyde Police has a responsibility to challenge that. And despite some significant challenges, I would suggest that we, we tackle that very well. But what I would also suggest is that by working not in isolation, but in partnership with others, 
we actually have the, the, the opportunity to target it even more effectively uh, and in a more coherent, uh, cohesive manner. Strathclyde Police, as I say, I think we do. I think we deal with it effectively. The difficulty is that we deal with the consequences of people's behaviour. We can carry out investigations, we can make arrests, we can report people to the court, they can be fined, they can go to prison. That is dealing with the consequences. If we are to maintain and establish a peace, a lasting peace, we actually have to work to influence the causes of people's behaviour. Um, we need to do that on a number of levels. We need to instil upon certain people a sense of responsibility. We need to instill within them certain values. Um, and one of the things that uh, caught my eye, it was most striking when I received the invitation to come to this evening's event, where the values that are listed at the bottom of that invitation, the values which members of the Amadi community are expected to live their lives by and to demonstrate on a daily basis. And what struck me was how closely those values resemble and reflect the values of Strathclyde Police. As an organisation, we have a mission statement which, which states our policing purpose. Now that purpose, something very recently, was to work together with others to build safer communities. And whilst that mission remains, we've shortened it even more in, in recent months to simply say our mission is to keep people safe. Because I think if people are safe, if people feel safe, then without being complacent, I think we can begin to think that we live in a more peaceful society, perhaps live in a better ordered uh, society. But amongst the policing values, we, we too share that value for respect and developing our understanding and appreciation of the many diverse communities that we have, not only in Strathclyde, but throughout Scotland. Um, and that's an appreciation, not only of the differences within those communities, but an appreciation of the many similarities that we also share. The values of integrity, and impartiality through which we undertake to be open, honest, transparent in all that we do, always striving to do the right thing, treating people fairly, sensitively, ethically, and keeping with their own customs, cultures and needs. Reliability. We would aspire to be a professional and dependable organisation. If we tell you we're going to do something, it should be our honest endeavour to do just that. Accountability. We need to open ourselves up to scrutiny. If our actions are justified, then we need to stand our height and say that. Similarly, where we make mistakes, we need to be quick to acknowledge that, to work, to right that wrong, and our honest endeavour should be to make sure that that mistake is never repeated. And finally, teamwork. As an organisation within Strathclyde, we have a diverse range of employees, and it's important that we harness their skills to allow us to work effectively towards delivering a service to communities. And if we take those values as a circle, that would bring us back to respect, and I would emphasise the importance not only of understanding our communities so that we can deliver an appropriate service to them, but understanding those communities sufficiently well that we can work with them effectively to keep people safe. Ladies and gentlemen, I would hope that my perhaps brief description of those values offers you some reassurance as to the commitment of Strathclyde Police in working towards establishing and maintaining some peace in society. I would conclude also by offering the assurance and the reassurance that Strathclyde Police will work willingly, enthusiastically and in partnership with any individual or any group which shares those values and which shares our commitment to establishing a peace. Thank you very much for your time. I would like to say how grateful I am for the invitation that was extended to me to come along this evening. 
A few weeks ago, when a few representatives from the community arrived at my door, my initial reaction was that this evening is a great idea. It's a fantastic idea for building peace because one of the fundamental tenets which holds together all the major religions in the world is this whole theme of peace and respect and how we are then called to treat other people. One of the main teachings of our Lord Jesus when he was asked by a person who comes up to him and asks him, Master, what is the greatest of all the commandments? His response is very quick and the response is very clear. He says the greatest of the commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and then tied with that to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says to the man asking, these are the two greatest commandments. Everything else, all the other laws, everything else which is there, all hang from these two commandments. The love and desire to serve God and the love and desire to serve other people. And then later in the gospel, he's asked the question, and who is my neighbor? You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? And he goes on to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. I wonder if many people here already know that story. And basically, the, what happens in the story is a man is, is attacked on the road, and he's left dying at the side of the road. And at first, coming down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, passes by a priest. And the priest sees the man in need and passes by on the other side. And then comes someone else. They see, the, they see the man lying there, badly treated, passes by on the other side. And then another person comes, passes by on the other side. And finally, the Samaritan, someone who, and this is very important for us, someone who is not a Jew, someone who's not a member of the chosen race or anything like that, the Samaritan is the one who then reaches out. The Samaritan is the one who cares for the man. And the whole point of that teaching is that at the very root of the Lord's teachings, at the very root of what we are called to do as Christians, is to reach out to other people. I apologize, I was a bit late in coming in this evening. The reason was that we have a vigil mass up in our own parish in St. Margaret's just up the road. It starts at half past five, so it's a wee bit late in coming in for the start. But again, over the last few weeks, we've been blessed to have a number of members of the community, your community, joining us at Holy Mass in St. Margaret's Church. In itself, a very, very powerful symbol. In itself, reaching out, promoting peace, promoting respect for other people's faith, for each other. Recognising that we're all called to do exactly the same work. And serving our God does not mean having dominion then over other people. It does not mean forcing other people to believe what we believe. It does not mean violence. It does not mean any of those things. Serving God through service of God means serving our God in the way that we reach out to other people, the way that we try to treat them, the way that we would want other people to treat us. That goes to the very root, and that teaching goes to the very core of what Christians believe. And just as it can be with Islam, it can also be with Christianity. You know, we too, in the, in the Christian religion, we too can have people who will use the teachings to try and justify violence and try and justify warfare and try and justify other things which are going on. But these people, as I'm sure you all agree, have a misunderstanding, a very profound misunderstanding of what the teachings of the Lord actually are. Because at the very root and the very core of those teachings is a fundamental respect for other people reaching out to other people, trying to be of service and good to other people, irrespective of the race, creed, colour, religion, whatever it may be. If we can possibly do good, we're called then to do good. And in so doing, that's how we live our faith. That's how we give our respect to our God. That's how we honour our God, by fulfilling that teaching he gave us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and tied with that, two sides of the same coin, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's why gathering together as we are this evening, even though the place may not be packed out and there may not be people standing, etc., it's still a very, very good thing for us to do because we're helping to foster, we're helping to sow those seeds of respect, helping to build peace, helping to build a tolerant and respectful society. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome along this evening a representative, a friend of mine, a great friend of mine here, Father Thaddeus Sumaru, 
who Father Thaddeus is a priest from northern Nigeria. And anyone who knows northern Nigeria, you'll know that in northern Nigeria, the main religion, the predominant religion, isn't Christianity. The predominant religion is Islam. And Father Thaddeus is here, Father Rumaru is here studying at Glasgow University, and he's currently writing his doctorate at the theology faculty, specifically on the issue of interreligious dialogue as a source of building peace. And when I said to Thaddeus that I'd been invited along here this evening, he thought it was a fantastic thing. So I asked if I could extend the invitation to him. And I was told, of course you can. Of course you can come along. So if it's okay, I would ask if this is okay, just for Father Thaddeus to say a wee quick word, just to round off what I'm saying about his own experience, which is far better than my experience, of two religions working together, Islam and Christianity working together in northern Nigeria. I ask myself, where did we miss all that? And it goes back years, years back. We'll be talking about the early 20th century when Christianity and Islam were taking root in northern Nigeria. Where we missed it, from my own point of view, is the fact that when all that was going on, the missionary activity was going on, that proactive activity of reaching out to the other person, to the other religious tradition, was not emphasized. So for us to build peace, we must be willing to reach out to the other. So this is a very, very proactive activity. And we must be willing and open to receive the other. Christians must be willing and open. Muslims must be willing and open, and members of other religious traditions must be willing and open to engage with the other person sincerely with respect. It's very, very important. As long as our fists are closed, there is no way we can build friendship. And whether we like it or not, the world is, will continue to be a global village. We are going to continue to be neighbors to one another. So the Islamic community is going to continue to grow here in the UK. And already the Christian community is there and other religious communities will come in. So the kind of violence, unfortunate violence and misinterpretation, mistrust and doubt that we have in northern Nigeria, if we don't prepare the ground here, it will happen. We may not be al alive to see it happen, but it, it will happen. So the more open we are to the other person with every sincerity, the better for peace, the better for development, the better for all of us, for Christianity and Islam, finally. The Quran and the Bible are rich resource material for peace building. And when we have to interpret these texts, we must be very, very careful. So those who preach, those who interpret, the kind of message you give, you're forming the minds of people. You're forming the minds of the young ones. All the stereotyping that goes on does not help us in any way. I am speaking from my own background and from my own experience. So in northern Nigeria, you have that kind of stereotyping that has led to conflict, and from conflict to violence, people have been killed, people have been maimed, people have been destroyed in the name of religion. And also, politicians do not help matters. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa adahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. أما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Most worthy chairman respected elders dear sisters and brothers It's an enormous honor for me that I'm given the opportunity to address this august assembly and uh, I owe you all a debt of gratitude for your scholarly presence here this afternoon. The topic which was given to me uh, is the teachings of the Holy Quran and the establishment of peace. It's a topic which is very challenging in its nature, not because it is hard to prove that the teachings of the Holy Quran 
ensure peace in almost every sphere of human interest and aspiration, but because this holy book, the Holy Quran, the, the sacred scripture of Muslims, is always unfairly maligned for promoting hatred and terrorism. For some of the listeners today, it would be very interesting to know this paradox. Uh, Dr. Ijaz Saib has also referred to that briefly, that the book which is accused of promoting hatred and terrorism has founded a religion named Islam, the very meaning of which is peace. And in this single word, Islam, which literally means peace, all teachings and attitudes of the Holy Quran are most beautifully and, and concisely reflected. One who becomes a true Muslim, not only himself enters a safe haven, but also guarantees it for others. The Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, defined a Muslim as one who causes no harm to others through his tongue, through his word or deed. In the contemporary world, which suffers from violence, bloodshed, conflict, wars, violation of human rights, and terrorism, we need peace more than anything. And the teachings of the Holy Quran regarding the establishment of peace are so elaborate and detailed that they guarantee peace and they guarantee and establish peace at all levels and all spheres, uh, individual, social, economic, national, and international. First and, and foremost, I'll explain the role of the Holy Quran for the establishment of interreligious peace about which uh, uh, our respected reverend has talked about. For a religion to be helpful in establishing peace of the world, it is absolutely necessary that such religion should be capable of uniting mankind on religious grounds and must itself accept the universality of prophethood, universality of religion, in, in a sense that human beings, whatever their color, race, or geographic denominations, they are all creatures of the same creator. And thus, they all are equally entitled to receive divine guidance from God Almighty. So the divine authority which, which gave birth or which sent his prophets in, in one area of the world must also have sent in other areas of the world. And this exactly is the message of the Holy Quran, the sacred scripture of Islam. It states, وَلَقَدْ بَاسْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولًا أَنَيَبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْتَنِبُ التَّاغُوتِ Chapter 16, verse 37. And the translation is, we did raise among every people a messenger with the teaching, worship Allah and shun the evil one. The Holy Quran also declares that the Holy Prophet of Islam is not the only prophet in the world. And God reminds him that by saying, thou art but a warner, verily, we have sent thee with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and as a warner. And there is no people to whom a warner has not been sent. Chapter 34, verses 24 and 25. In view of the above, it is manifestly clear that Islam does not monopolize the truth to the elimination of all other religions, but categorically declares that in all ages and in all parts of the world, God has been looking after the spiritual and religious needs of mankind by raising messengers who delivered the divine message to the people to whom they were raised and commissioned. Even if we, if, if we go through the pages of all religious scriptures, 
we won't find a similar teaching in them. Now, I mean, a Jew, for example, may look down on Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, or may, God forbid, call him a false prophet. Or a Hindu, for example, may consider Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, as, as imposters. But a Muslim leaves the pale of Islam the moment he fails to appreciate and, and, and accept all of them as prophets of God. And this is the, the most practical step Islam has taken towards creating an atmosphere of peace and goodwill among the followers of various faiths. And, and no other uh, holy book, I would say, has presented such teaching. Regarding the establishment of interreligious peace, the, the question of the attainment of salvation is also very important. Of course, uh, I admit that it is the right of every religion to claim that those who want to attain salvation and seek to be delivered from Satan should come to the safe haven of that religion. But to state that those who do not join them will be damned eternally or they cannot lead a life of purity and piety, whatever they do to please God, it would be a very rigid and non-tolerant view. And even some Muslim scholars, unfortunately, have entertained such, such views and have entertained such belief. But the Holy Quran has presented a teaching which is, which is totally contrary to this. And according to the teachings of the Holy Quran, salvation cannot be monopolized by, by any single religion of the world. It says, it, and it very clearly says, it is chapter number five, verse 70. Surely those who believed in Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Jews, and the Sabians, and the Christians, whoso believe in Allah and the last day, and does good deeds, on them shall come no fear, nor shall they grieve. The word Sabian, which was used in the verse, refers to the followers of all non-Arab religions uh, which have their own revealed books. Again, the, the Holy Quran states, among the people of the book are those who are very pious and God-fearing and who stand by their covenant. They recite the word of Allah in the hours of night and prostrate themselves before him. They believe in Allah and the last day and enjoin good and forbid evil, and hasten to vie with one another in good works. These are among the righteous. Whatever good they do, they shall not be denied its due reward. And Allah well knows those who guard against evil. Chapter 3, verses 114 to 116. So this misunderstanding that according to Islam, all Jews or Christians are hell-bound, or, or they, they, they are wrong, is totally false in the light of what I've just recited before you from the Holy Quran. Now, one can easily understand that religious peace cannot be achieved without cultivating such broad-minded, magnanimous, and humanely understanding attitudes towards the people of other faiths. It is very important to note in this regard that the Holy Quran does not permit the use of force as an instrument for the spread of its message. It declares there should be no compulsion in religion. Surely, right has become distinct from wrong. So, according to the Holy Quran, there is no need for any coercion or force for converting someone to Islam and addressing the holy founder of Islam, God clearly warns him of entertaining any idea of force in, in an attempt to reform society. His status as reformer is made very clear in the Holy Quran. In the following verse, God says, Admonish, therefore, for thou art but an admonisher. Thou hast 
no authority to compel them. Chapter 88, verse 22. Thus, according to the teachings of the Holy Quran, to profess, to propagate, practice, and exercise, or to denounce, or to change one's belief, is altogether a matter of choice. And a Muslim is not allowed to use force and coercion in such matters. Let us now see the role of the Holy Quran in providing social peace for the contemporary society. The modern world has become very conscious of uh, rising levels of pollution in the material atmosphere, but probably they, are, they, are, they have become totally negligent of the rapidly rising level of uh, pollution in our social environment. The, this, the modern societies today suffer from countless spiritual maladies and I mean, they can be counted, for example, ex exploitation, duplicity, hypocrisy, selfishness, oppression, greed, mad pursuit of pleasure, lack of responsibility, and all such social maladies have, have become very commonplace in modern society. The Holy Quran creates a climate, or tries to crea create a climate, which is as different from the one described above, having all such social maladies, as spring is from autumn. And within the Islamic concept of society, Islam moderates, disciplines, and trims the, the natural habits of human beings. And consequently, it aims to create a society which remains away from all those social evils. The Holy Quran has given detailed and comprehensive teachings of do's and don'ts, which run into many hundreds. And uh, it has very clear injunctions regarding good deeds, which a Muslim must practice. And they can be counted as do's of the Holy Quran. Uh, and they are, for example, I, I have the quotations for all of them, but I will just count the do's, for example. They are chastity, preserving chastity, cleanliness, courage, cooperation, doing good, enjoining good and forbidding evil, excelling in good deeds, uh, feeding the hungry, forgiveness, giving of true evidence, good treatment of employees, good treatment of neighbors, good treatment of relatives, gratefulness, humility, justice, making peace between people, making peace between nations, patience, Purity, self-control, sincerity, truthfulness, unselfishness, etc., etc. They run in hundred, into hundreds. And the don'ts of the Holy Quran are also very clearly mentioned. And they are um, arrogance, backbiting, boasting, defamation of others, derision, envy, extravagance, haughtiness, giving short measure, nicknaming others, niggardliness, suspicion, telling lies, theft, murder, robbery, everything is mentioned in the Holy Quran. So the, the central core of this teaching is common to almost all religions. I mean, Christianity also have uh, the, the list of do's and don'ts, and similarly, I mean, Judaism also has similar do's and don'ts. So now I'll go for some distinctive features of Islam for the establishment of social peace. The teachings of the Holy Quran provide conditions of peace for all those who heed his admonitions, neighbors and wayfarers, rich and poor, young and old, men and women, all alike. Firstly, in this connection, I'll take the Islamic teaching regarding murder and, sh and the shedding of the innocent blood of someone. God says in the Holy Quran, whosoever killed a person, unless it be for killing a person or for creating disorder in the land, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. And whoso gave life to one, it shall be as if he had given life to all mankind. Chapter 5. 
verse 33. Now you can see that according to the teachings of the Holy Quran, the taking of a single life is to take someone's, to taking, the taking of a single life is like the massacre of thousands of innocent lives. It is very obvious that how big a sin, how big a sin it is to take someone's life without reason. Commenting on this verse, which I have just quoted, the promised Messiah, Islam, the holy founder of Ahmadiyya Muslim community says, he who abandons kindness, abandons religion. The Holy Quran teaches that whosoever kills a person without justifiable cause will be as if he has killed the whole world. In the same way I say that if someone is not kind unto his brother, it is like he has been unkind to the whole world. And this uh, quotation is taken from the commentary of the Holy Quran written by the Holy Founder of Ahmadiyya Muslim community. In the presence of such teaching, whosoever involves in an act of murder or terrorism acts against the teachings of Islam. Then again, in, in, uh, while I'm talking about uh, the establishment of social peace, uh, I must talk about the rights of women in Islam. Before the advent of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, women in Arabia were deprived of their rights and they were distributed as inheritance. And the birth of a girl was considered to be a matter of disgrace and extreme shame. And some cruel and proud Arabs had the shamelessness to bury their newborn daughters alive. And, and grown-up women in that society were treated as, as shuttles and, and sex objects. Islam changed all that. By, by recognizing the social status of women in the society and by recognizing their rightful place in the society as wives and mothers and by securing their rights in inheritance, in divorce, in the guardianship of children, in the management of the affairs of the family, and in worship, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, established peace in the family on a firm basis. The Holy Quran is the first ever scripture to state that they, the women, have rights similar and equal to those of men over them in equity. Chapter number two, verse 229. There is thus total equality and there is no difference whatsoever between the fundamental human rights of women and men. And Islam, again, is the first ever religion to give women rights of inheritance. The Holy Quran states that, O ye people, fear your Lord, who created you from a single soul and created therefrom its mate, and from the two spread many men and women. And it says, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female, and we have made you into tribes and sub-tribes for the sake of easy recognition. Verily, the most honorable among you is the most righteous in the sight of Allah. Surely, Allah is all-knowing, all aware. Chapter 49, verse 12. Thus, the Holy Quran has eliminated racism from its root by stating that all racial differences are for the sake of easy recognition. And the real honor in, in God's sight, in, in the sight of Allah, lies in the piety of heart. The teachings of the Holy Quran regarding the establishment of economic peace are also an invaluable source of guidance for us. The Holy Quran removes 
vast disparities of wealth and poverty necessary for the establishment of economic peace, and in, it enjoins and orders the distribution of inheritance among all heirs, parents, children, widows, brothers, sisters, all alike. And uh, Islam has also recognized in principle uh, the right of the poor in the wealth of the rich, and through the institution of zakat, which Islam has in, in, uh, introduced, uh, Islam has provided for the discharge of all those rights that the poor have in the wealth of the rich. Zakat is a kind of um, um, uh, money which is taken from, from the rich people and given to poor people. The concept of interest has played havoc with the economic peace of many households and institutions and even governments in, 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 in the present world. The prohibition of interest is central to the economic philosophy of Islam. Allah loves benef beneficence towards the poor and the needy. So Islam exhorts that if somebody is in true need of some help, so it should be done without interest. For the settlement of international disputes and for the establishment of international peace, the following verse of the Holy Quran is very pertinent. It states, and if two parties of believers fight against each other, make peace between them, then if after that one of them transgresses against the other, fight the party that transgresses until it returns to the command of Allah. Then, if it returns, make peace between them with equity and act justly. Verily, Allah loves the just. Chapter 49, verse 10. This verse serves an ex as an excellent model for the whole world and especially the, the United Nations. Islam forbids aggression but urges us to fight if failure to fight jeopardizes peace and promotes war. This is the teaching on which peace can ultimately be built, and this is the teaching on which the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, based his practice. In the end, I, I just want to state that according to the teaching of the Holy Quran, the true peace of the world and the true peace of human heart lies only in returning and turning towards God. According to the Islamic philosophy and the philosophy of the Holy Quran, just as a salmon cannot find peace until it returns to the place of its origin, its spawning ground. Similarly, the human heart cannot find peace without spiritually returning to its source of creation, uh, that is God. And this is the meaning of the verse of the Holy Quran. It is only, God says, it is only in the remembrance of Allah that hearts can find peace. Chapter 13, verse 29. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much and uh, hello everyone. It's a few years now since I first uh, came across friends um, in Ahmadiyya Association and um, I'm very, very glad to be here again at another event that has been run. And one of the reasons that I um, am so admiring of this association and so glad to be here is because I stand before you as a, as a person of no particular faith and I'm not a follower of any religion. However, I feel that's what's so very important about this association is that they reach out, as we heard earlier, which is so important, reaching out and have an acceptance of differing views and a realization that regardless of differing views, we can all come together uh, for what is most important. And for me, uh, that is peace, whether it be in our communities and in our families, whether it be in our towns or our nations and internationally, peace is what matters. And I hope too uh, that uh, despite uh, having no faith, you will realize and accept that I and many others like me uh, try very hard to live our lives along the values of Jesus, the man, and Muhammad, uh, the man, and according to the tenets of much of the teaching in the Holy Bible. 
and the Holy Quran. And the, the overarching phrase of the Ahmadiyya Association is something that attracts me so very, very much, love for all and hatred for none. I was asked uh, to talk about the role of politicians towards peace. And uh, despite our friend from Northern Nigeria's views, uh, I would say to you that uh, certainly in this country here that is Scotland, there are many, many politicians um, of varying political parties who believe very, very much uh, that peace is the most important thing that any politician can strive to help to achieve uh, for their own nation and to give examples to nations elsewhere. Many aspects to peace, of course, uh, here in Scotland. There's the uh, peace in relation to um, being anti-war. And again, may I say to you, I'm not a pacifist. I absolutely believe in the right of people to defend their own nation against external aggression and indeed to fight for themselves when they are being um, oppressed internally. But there's big issues there. I don't believe that peace has ever come from dropping bombs, for example. I think it uh, comes from a self-awareness, a self-enlightenment, however the individual achieves that, and of course from education of what is most important to us all, most important to humanity. I would say to you therefore that I find it a personal abomination that here in our country we have weapons of, of mass destruction sitting not too far away from here on the River Clyde. The role of politicians in Scotland, for some of us, it is constantly campaigning against uh, having nuclear weaponry in our country and on our shores. Another role of politicians is to um, address some of the issues that we have in our own society, to be alert to them and to tackle them. I would give an example of the current uh, proposed legislation on anti-sectarianism in our own society here in Scotland, particularly here in the west of Scotland. It is the role of a politician, I believe, to tackle inequality, to tackle poverty and bigotry, and the promotion of hatred. And I would suggest that legislation is one of the ways that politicians can do that, as well as raising awareness and being supportive of organisations and uh, beliefs and faiths such as that of most people here today. Uh, tackle things, work together, reach out to others to try and achieve the best for our society. I also believe that the role of a politician is to very, very much listen to people. Because I, I believe that the vast majority of people, regardless of their creed, their colour, where they come from, are actually very, very decent and very, very good and want the best. So I think it's very, very important that politicians listen to these people. Because I think it's ordinary folk from the grassroots up that will establish peace, who will force peace, who will enforce those who have power and far too often have a fear of losing power, which then makes them corrupt, which makes them work against the best for the people for whom they are supposed to work and whom they are supposed to represent. I think what we've been seeing in quite a lot of the Arab countries recently is a mark of that, where people will come together and it reaches that point where the people must be heard and those who purport to be leaders eventually have to follow. Because I don't actually believe that you can separate peace from personal freedom and from freedom of thought, freedom of movement and freedom of expression. I believe too that one of the words that we use an awful lot in our society that I constantly rail against, and I, I don't think I've heard it today and about that I'm very glad, is that word tolerance. We keep hearing how we should tolerate this, there should be religious tolerance, there should be equality tolerance. Actually, I think there should be acceptance because I don't believe any one of us has the right to say that what someone else is doing is wrong 
unless that someone else is harming someone by what they are doing. So I think the word we should all strive for is acceptance, acceptance of differing views, acceptance of different ways of life, acceptance of being different from the norm. I think that's extremely important and a word that we should use very, very often. Thank you. We heard um, our friend uh, Atta al Mumin speak about the United Nations. Politicians again coming together across the boundary, that small global um, community that we now have. I don't believe for a minute that the United Nations is a wonderful organisation, that it doesn't need change. There are many things within the United Nations that I think could do with some changes, with a lot more work, and be more representative of the people uh, which it is supposed to represent. But I do think it's important that across nations we do have organisations where we talk, where we reach out, and where we try very, very hard to strive for peace. And I leave you uh, with a quote which I absolutely believe um, from one Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who worked very hard towards the establishment of the United Nations. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, it isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must also work for it. I am so glad that the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association is working for peace. And I hope that many, many other people across all these false divides that we have created will work together for peace for the future. Thank you very, very much. I am very thankful to all of you that you have accepted our invitation and have uh, uh, spared these uh, moments and uh, decided to join with us on this evening. And uh, in a busy life, uh, sometimes it is not very easy to spare time for such uh, activities which uh, are non-commercial. You don't uh, see any financial, you know, the immediate reward. Well, uh, uh, I really appreciate that uh, you have shown that uh, you are not a materialistic person. You have got uh, some sense of responsibility and you value our call for the peace in the society. And uh, as uh, you have heard from the speakers different viewpoints and the purpose is that to know more about these things because without knowledge we are in the dark. More we know, more we uh, exchange the views, more we hear about different, uh, you know, the school of thoughts, then we are in a better position to establish the peace. And that is the purpose of uh, our, this conference. I am also very thankful to the speakers uh, and uh, 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 Rev Reverend Father Joseph and uh, Father Umro if I am pronouncing rightly. <laughs> uh, they have uh, given us uh, quite a, you know, uh, uh, good description from the Christian perspective. And uh, we uh, really appreciate that uh, they have come here and uh, because, despite of the busy schedule, uh, Father Joseph was uh, in a, you know, taking a mosque and uh, straight away he, you know, came here. We are very thankful to him. Similarly, you know that uh, police is very busy trying to establish peace in the society, <laughs> but still our uh, chief inspector, Stuart uh, Rorison, he was kind enough to accept our invitation and he came here and he has enlightened us the role of the police uh, in this regard. I am also very thankful to Linda Fabiani, member of the Scottish Parliament. This is not her first, uh, uh, you know, uh, participation in our peace conferences. F few years ago, first time she came across uh, in our one of the peace conferences in uh, uh, what is the name of the place? Uh, Straven. And at that time, one of the questions, you know, <laughs> if Linda remembers that, was asked that. Why, why Straven you have chosen? <laughs> and this time, 
when we were organizing the meeting you know here in uh, uh, this uh, uh, town johnston uh, i approached one of uh, the local rotary club and uh, the first question the you know the president of the rotary club asked me why johnston <laughs> Why you have chosen this, you know. So this also shows to some extent that uh, people think uh, that peace is, uh, you know, not very important. Or to talk about the peace is not very important. Fact of the matter is that uh, in our recent few, you know, if you go uh, back a few, uh, few months back, what happened in England? The riots. And those riots were not from outside. It was emerging from within the community. So we need to talk about the issues which disturbs the peace of the society. So I am very thankful that uh, the audience who have come here and uh, some of the very prominent, uh, you know, the representative of the communities are here as well and uh, the representative of the Queen uh, 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 is, uh, you know, also gracing this uh, uh, occasion with his presence. Uh, I am thankful to all of you and uh, in the end uh, I would uh, request you that the message which you have taken from this conference today, please try to spread this message in your, uh, you know, the areas wherever you live, wherever you work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abid Saab. Uh, we would end the uh, proceedings in our traditional way. The traditional way is that we thank God by praying to him. We raise our hands to our face and pray. All those present who wish to join us are welcome or are welcome to pray in their own way. And this would be followed by dinner, which will be served at the backside. May I request uh, Molana Daud Saab to kindly lead us in silent prayer. Please join me in silent prayer. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you very much once again. I thought it was very beneficial. It was a very good thing to do because at the core root of society we have to build this peace. We have to work together to create this peace. So the work of the Ahmadiyya community in putting together these conferences is invaluable work. Uh, I would say it's a wonderful opportunity and a very proactive opportunity. It is good for communities, especially religious communities, to engage with one another. And this evening's event is an opportunity and it's a coming together of this engagement between religious communities to build education and to build peace. So it's an opportunity to understand one another, an opportunity to learn from one another because these are the key prospects and aspects of peace. So the audience were very good, the speakers well, quite very good, honest and sincere. Uh, it's a learning process for all of us. It was excellent. The guest turnover was around uh, 55 guests. Uh, we had uh, representation from the Christians uh, in a form of two reverends who attended apart from the Scottish Member of Parliament. Uh, I think the questions were answered and there was a lot of interest in Islam and people were very fascinated by and people were very fascinated by uh, uh, the true uh, picture of Islam uh, and they were happy and the food was wonderful as well. Thank you. Um, I think there were some very, very positive things came out of it, some very, very good messages uh, and I hope that um, people who have attended will take something from it and we can perhaps progress um, as, a, as a community. So yes, very well good. Yeah. Um, well, I was very pleased to be invited, as always, to the, the Amadea Peace events. Um, I haven't managed to get to all of your peace conferences, but I try to get along when I can. And I have to say, it's my first time in Johnston, so that was a new thing for me. Um, it was a very interesting evening. I learned a lot from all the speakers, in particular 
Um, the Malana that came up from London, I thought he gave a, a very interesting talk. I learned a great deal. And um, as somebody else said later on in the question and answer, um, it's a duty for all of us to learn as much as we can because without it we're all living in the dark. And uh, it's only by understanding and, and appreciating other people's points of view that we have any hope of improving peace in the world. I always find that the conference is extremely interesting because there's always something to learn. Um, and for everyone it's you have to be open-minded, learn different things about it. And yeah, I thought it was great. I thought it was a really good topic. And I thought everyone played into that topic very well. Peace is something that, uh, that everyone cares about and that everyone should play their part in, whether it be Islam or whether it be those who are Christian or, or whether indeed it be people of all denominations, all religions and none. Peace is common to all of us. It's best for all of us and we should all work together.